So onto the hustings. 15 women's organizations have come together to bring you this opportunity to hear from party leadership about their priorities at the next Scottish Parliament election. Of course, we also encourage those parties to not let this be the only time they talk about women's equality at this election. The women's organizations who've worked together to bring you tonight are Scottish Women's Aid, Scottish Women's Rights Centre, YWCA Scotland, the Young Women's Movement, Close the Gap, Zero Tolerance, the Scottish Women's Budget Group, Girl Guiding Scotland, Rape Crisis Scotland, Glasgow Women's Library, Dundee International Women's Centre, Amina Muslim Women's Resource Centre, Women 5050, The Parliament Project, and Equate Scotland. Questions have been submitted by attendees tonight and cover a wide range of topics from climate change to endometriosis. And while we won't have a chance to ask them all tonight, we'll do all we can to share them afterwards. Please be aware that there will be questions relating to violence against women tonight. And of course, please log off the call at any time if you feel you need to. So tonight we'll be hearing from the leadership of five of the parties currently represented at Holyrood who are fielding candidates in this Scottish Parliament election. There are, of course, other parties running, although time and the limitations of Zoom means we cannot hear from all of them here. These parties are all listed in the programme that you received in your email with the Zoom link and we'll share more information about them as the election continues. So without any further ado, I'm delighted to welcome our chair for the evening, Tasneem Nazir. Tasneem is an award-winning journalist, author and freelance TV reporter. She's written for a variety of print and online publications, including The Huffington Post, Al Jazeera English, The BBC, The Guardian, TRT World, BBC Radio 2, and many more. She received the Ambassador for Peace Award from the Universal Peace Federation for her interfaith journalism work in promoting better interfaith relations and has been voted as one of the top 40 inspirational Muslim women in the world by American Muslim magazine, MB Muslima. Welcome, Tasneem. Thank you, Emma, for kindly introducing me. I'm delighted to chair tonight's party leaders hosting on women's equality, organized by Engender in partnership with national women's equality organizations right across Scotland. It's great to see a significant number of you all join us tonight to have your questions answered by our party political representatives who will outline their commitments for women's equality ahead of the Scottish parliamentary elections. Without further ado, I'd like to first start by introducing our speakers for tonight. We have with us Jackie Bailey, Deputy Leader of Scottish Labour, Rachel Hamilton, Scottish Conservative Party spokesman in Social Security and Older People, Willie Rennie, leader of the Scottish Liberal Democrats, Lorna Slater, co-leader of the Scottish Green Party, and Nicola Sturgeon, First Minister and SNP Party leader. Thank you all so much for taking the time to join us today. I'm going to start off with the first question and ask each of our speakers to respond to this question when prompted. Our first question is, what are your priorities for women in the next Scottish Parliament? And first to answer is Lorna Slater of the Scottish Green Party. Thank you so much for inviting me to the hustings. Uh, of all of the events that I'm speaking at, this is probably the most timely and urgent. Um, the impact of COVID has worsened pre-existing gender equalities from the uneven burden of both paid and unpaid care work to the impact of gender-based violence and the barriers to accessing support under the pandemic restrictions. A lot of us feel worried when we're out at night and when we're walking down the street. The stories that women have shared on social media are heartrending and show us that this is a universal experience. It should not be like this. Uh, I think in addition, women have a specific role to play in tackling the climate crisis. We approach problems differently, more collaboratively, with longer term thinking, more in thinking about what we have in common than what divides us. The climate crisis is of course bigger than Scotland and we can work with women all over the world in tackling it. We need of course to be aware that our actions on climate affect women in the global south even more 
greatly than it affects us here. The Scottish Greens will prioritize ensuring that the work that women do is recognized, valued, rewarded, and supported. We will work to tackle all forms of violence against women and make sure that all survivors of abuse are supported. We will extend abortion rights by removing the two doctor rule. We will protect and extend the rights of trans women and our non-binary siblings. To do this, we need to have a parliament that looks more like Scotland. And that means more women, more young people, more people who have chosen to make Scotland their home, more disabled people and more women from different backgrounds. This is the feminism that I believe in and the feminism that is central to our vision of a fairer, greener, independent Scotland. Thank you, Laura. I'd now like to pass on to Rachel Hamilton, please, to address the question. Thank you. Um, can I first, firstly start by thanking Engender and uh, the other partner organisations for tonight's event and uh, for all the work that you do and continue to do across a whole range of issues affecting women and the work that you do with us in the Parliament as well. Especially those interventions and thoughtful policy proposals that you um, bring about and, and present to us um, particularly to stand up for women who are experiencing some of the most degrading um, or awful experiences of their lives. And uh, put simply, last month was a hard month for women. The disappearance of Sarah Everard and the discovery of her body shocked us all. The fact that all of this occurred in the same week as International Women's Day made an unbearable situation even worse. And that week on social media, I'm sure that many of you here saw the accounts of women up and down the country who had been threatened, catcalled, stalked, abused, or intim intimidated. And sadly, some of you may have had uh, experiences um, of a similar nature. And to some, it can feel like progress has been made. However, we still have events like those that happened last month that show us how far we've still got to go. And that is why I believe that the next Scottish Parliament must focus on the following areas. Firstly, we must tackle domestic violence. The latest statistics show that the number of domestic abuse charges are at a four year high. And this is a problem that has been exacerbated by the pandemic. Since COVID began, almost 1500 domestic crimes, abuse crimes have been recorded in Scotland. And with the first lockdown, seeing incidents of domestic abuse 9% higher than the same period in 2019. And that is shocking. I was proud to vote for both domestic abuse bills in the Parliament, but statistics like these show that more needs to be done. And that's why. Okay, is that time, did you say? Yeah. Thank you. I'd now like to pass on to Nicola Sturgeon. Thank you very much, and thanks to Engender. I really hope this is an election campaign with women issues. Uh, right at its heart. Uh, when we look across the last five years, many of the big events that have happened from Brexit to COVID with Me Too in between have disproportionately affected women, but I'm not always sure the public debate reflects that. Let me just give a very quick uh, summary of some of the key issues that will be in the SNP manifesto. Uh, firstly, making sure we better value the work that women do, our plans for a national care service and a national wage for those who work in social care is key to that. We must continue to take action to reduce the gender pay gap, do more to support women who want to set up businesses and reduce the financial burden for women at key points in their life. One of our proposals is to suspend interest on student loan repayments during maternity leave, for example. We want to have a comprehensive women's health plan so that we have greater understanding and awareness of endometriosis and better uh, diagnosis and uh, services, better awareness of the menopause, support for abortion services. Um, and lastly, much more action to tackle violence against women and to make Scotland a safer place for women and girls. We are likely, if uh, Helena Kennedy's group recommends this, to legislate for a specific criminal offence of misogynistic harassment. And one of the things I want to highlight tonight is continued support for Equally Safe and from the SNP's manifesto, a commitment to significantly 
increase investment. Uh, we have plans for a £100 million three-year funding stream to focus on prevention, but also support for frontline services. One of the things we must do is reduce the time women have to wait if they're seeking support for domestic abuse to get out of abusive relationships or seeking support after experiencing violence. And of course, all of that has to be underpinned by a parliament and a cabinet that looks more like Scotland. I'm proud to have a gender balanced cabinet. I'm proud to have uh, an almost gender balanced slate of candidates at this election, but there's much more That's for kind of all of us still to do. And I'd now like to pass it on to Willie Rennie to address the question. Thank you. Uh, thank you for to Engender and to all the partner organisations uh, for the invitation uh, to be here this evening. Uh, I love to run often before the sun is up in the morning in the hills behind my house. It gives me time to think about both the little things and the big things in life. And I can put my headphones on, stick on a podcast and not pay too much attention to what's around me. I'm guilty of taking that for granted. With what's happened to Sarah Everard, and the conversations that have followed is horrifically clear that many women don't have the same privilege. Women have the same right to feel safe and to be safe. These challenges are not faced by just a few. I and our equality spokesperson, Karen Lindsay, have already been in contact with the various party leaders to see if we can get the priority in the next parliament to have a new commission on violence against women and girls with that cross-party backing. I'm very conscious that I'm the only man on the, the panel this evening. And that is because I was invited as leader, but I'm also here today to show you how seriously I take this as leader. I'm a liberal, equality is in our DNA. I must admit I was embarrassed when all of our MSPs elected in 2016 were middle-aged white men, and it was not good enough. So I set about making changes. I can't describe how delighted I was when Beatrice Wishart won in Shetland. And if that was after a Wendy Chamberlain won in North East Fife and Christine Jarden won in Edinburgh West. They're all great additions to our team. But their elections did not happen by chance. They were elected because they're brilliant and because our party changed. I dearly hope that one of the outcomes of this election is many, many more women are returned, women of colour too. Our politics and our policies would be so much better for it. Many have said that the pandemic turned back the clock on gender equality. I'm... Okay. Thank you, Willie. I'm now going to be asking a set of three questions and we'll give each of the speakers opportunity to address these three questions when prompted. Now, the first question, Partners on this event work on women's labour market inequality with a focus on a range of different groups, including young women, women in STEM and BMA women. What will you do in your first parliamentary year to improve women's labour market quality and close the gender pay gap? What would each party prioritise to ensure that public spending works to build greater equality between women and men? And lastly, what more will you do to support unpaid carers? If we could have Rachel Hamilton address these questions first, please. I think, yes, go ahead, Rachel. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I, I very much um, agree with the Equate Scotland's asks um, for 2021, which are all about rebuilding the economy and, and putting women at the heart of it. And I think that the asks for increasing representation of um, women in STEM jobs and improving those STEM skills will be key to the our future um, economic growth and our prosperity. But um, women need to get a fair share of that as well. I think that um, in terms of the Scottish uh, Conservatives contribution, we want to see um, a STEM teacher um, in every school. So we want to encourage young people to go into those uh, tech subjects and uh, take take on engineering subjects and, and construction. And we know that um, in the college sector that women are underrepresented, uh, underrepresented in uh, those, those fields. Um, but I mean, we, we have to uh, take into account that COVID has had a, a significant effect on um, you know, disproportionate impact on women. Um, women have been more likely to become redundant 
And I think it's important that we um, ensure that we we put women at the heart of that recovery. Um, in in terms of um, some of the other stuff, we would like a coronavirus job council, which would bring together different sectors um, to be at the heart of that recovery. And we would hope that women would be part of that. Um, the other thing, of course, is that apprenticeships and training, um, they're out there. But to retrain and re-skill um, uh, women and get more women into apprenticeships, we need to iron out those um, inequalities. Uh, and, and that is something that we would be very much looking at. And also to uh, put women at the heart of the kickstarts um, schemes and the young person's guarantee. But it is really important on the point that I made there about the apprenticeships, that we must be more inclusive and challenge those gender stereotypes so it can offer women more of a choice in a, a variety of industries. Um, I, could, I could go on if you want, but one of the other, other things is that I think is really important is to help women get um, to work. Now, we know that women have been affected in terms of the responsibilities they've had, whether it's a young child that they're caring for a family or their homeschooling. But um, there was a woman in my constituency who unfortunately had to give up her job because her husband was working as well and there was no one to look after um, her elderly parents and her children. And so it is important that we have you know, a, a, a wrap around childcare, and that's what Scottish Conservatives are proposing. We feel disappointed that the 1140 hours um, has been delayed, but we do support it. But we think we could go further with a wrap around childcare. Thank you, Rachel. Could we now hear from uh, First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, please? Thanks very much. I'll try to uh, cover all of those questions as, as briefly as possible. In terms of you know, how we support more women into underrepresented parts of the labour market, but make sure that they are properly valued in the labour market. Uh, we support and will continue to support Equate Scotland, uh, which does a lot of very good work around uh, supporting women in STEM education and STEM professions. I do think there is a huge, huge uh, imperative to better value the work that is disproportionately done by women, which is why our focus on the care sector is so important. Um, we need to support more women to start up their own businesses, not just from an equality point of view, important though that is, but if women in Scotland started businesses at the same rate as men do, that would have a huge be a positive benefit for our economy overall. And we will continue to put pressure on businesses to be transparent around their gender pay gap so that transparency can, as it already is doing, but not fast enough, it leads to a closing of that gap. We need to uh, mainstream gender budgeting much more so that all of our budgetary decisions around what we spend on public services take proper account of uh, the impact on, on women. And that is a really, really important uh, aspect of this. I think particularly coming out of COVID when we need to redress some of the imbalances that have been exacerbated. Uh, childcare, we have prioritised 11.40 hours delayed slightly because of COVID, but on track for completion by August. But certainly our manifesto will set out the next steps in wraparound childcare and extending uh, that state funded offer of childcare even beyond where it is just now. Uh, lastly, on unpaid carers, uh, about 60% of unpaid carers are women. Uh, we will protect and look to enhance carers allowance, both in terms of uh, value but also eligibility. We have established the carer supplement, uh, which means that unpaid carers get more support in Scotland than they do elsewhere in the UK. We've enhanced that during COVID, uh, but it's also really important that we get the services that support unpaid carers back to normal as quickly as possible as we come out of COVID and look to make sure that through our health service and other services, we are supporting the needs of carers as they care uh, for those that they, they love. So there's lots in all of these questions that are is very central to the, the plans that we have been taking forward as government and will look to extend in our manifesto for this election. Thank you, Nicola. Could I now have, could I now have Willie Rennie address these questions, please? Um, yeah, thanks very much. Um, I think at this, the centre of this is we, we need to have um, pay audits in government at all different levels. So local government, the agencies, as well as government to make sure we've got embedded in the system 
equality in pay, but we also need to go further and look at ethnic minorities and disabled employees as well. And I want to, and I'm a passionate supporter of the expansion of childcare, particularly down to two-year-olds, and I'm concerned about the, the use of um, the facility by two-year-olds. The take-up is not great, so we need to try and uh, improve that. And pay for the social care sector, I think, needs to be addressed. The turnover in the sector is high. It's dominated by, by women, and we need to make sure that they're paid a decent wage um, rather than what they receive just now. And that will not only help them, but also help the service to provide a, a better quality service. I support the work of Equate Scotland. I think in terms of unpaid carers, we do need to look at the enhancement of support uh, for them, including the additional support services in terms of respite and others that are available um, for them. So those are the kind of packages of support that I'd like to see. And then on, finally, on apprenticeships, uh, we need to make sure that the imbalance that currently exists on apprenticeships is evened out. So we make a greater offer or a wider range of um, apprenticeships and make sure that there is a balance in it across the genders. Thank you, Willie. I'll now like to pass on to Jackie Bailey to address the questions. Hi, Tasman. Hey, uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, just to let you know that we're adding on some extra time for Jackie for this answer um, because she was inadvertently missed off the first round and didn't get to make an opening statement. So um, we'll add that onto your time, Jackie. Don't worry, I've taken no offence whatsoever at that. I thought I'll save my, my, keep my powder dry until the end. But, but thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to speak. Um, I, I want to touch briefly on, on the questions, um, but actually maybe put it in a, a wider context because, you know, there is much agreement, I think, across the political parties about what we need to do um, in the next Parliament for Women. And I hope that level of kind of agreement you see tonight continues into the parliament so that we cooperate across party um, to actually make a difference because it's been an incredibly tough year um, for, for women in particular, because they've been at the front line of the pandemic, you know, whether they've been the care workers, the nurses, the homeschoolers, that was probably the most difficult thing, um, but, but more likely to be on furlough twice as likely to be unemployed as a result of the pandemic. Um, and for me, that's emphasized the structural inequalities that exist. And that's actually what we need to address. So it might not be sexy to talk about um, disaggregate, gender disaggregated data, intersectional data, but we need that information and government and public bodies should collect it. Um, we need to tackle occupational segregation. And let me agree with Nicola Sturgeon, I think, Equate Scotland do a tremendous job, but I've seen initiatives in my own local area where you've got preschool and primary school initiatives, universities working in classrooms on STEM subjects, encouraging you know, young girls from, from the age of five to get involved. And it's that kind of generational change that I hope we see. Equally, I hope we see um, changes in employment programmes that the government runs, um, where there is a gendered pattern of skills, um, there is a gendered pattern of employment that, that we are perpetuating, that's true of apprenticeships too. So if we have the data and we know what the problem is, then we're more likely to be able to fix it. I'm a great fan of gender budgeting. Um, it was something that, that was introduced much earlier. I worry sometimes that it's an add-on rather than built in um, to the very heart of the process. And I'm equally of the view that it just can't be the Scottish government that's doing it. We need to encourage that kind of approach throughout the public sector, given that so many of them deliver services that, that women enjoy or experience. Um, better valuing um, women in terms of pay is very much at the heart of what the Scottish Labour Party want to do. In terms of pay, we want equal pay audits for all public sector organisations, but we also want them for private companies who provide public services through procurement. We will couple that with a one-off fund to deal with historic costs of equal pay in the public sector so that those claims are settled. And in terms of low pay, we had what I thought was quite an ambitious but, but perfectly reasonable suggestion in the budget of taking social care workers 
who are predominantly female, predominantly low paid, and actually paying them immediately 12 pounds an hour, um, rising to 15 pounds an hour by the end of the parliament. And the reason we did that is they are such a low paid sector. If we valued social care, if we valued caring professions, then that would overnight change the experience of women in the labour market and value those jobs in the future. And um, one final point, the Economy Committee of the Parliament, in, in quite an unusual step, actually did some work on closing the pay gap um, and on, on you know, um, equal pay. And one of the recommendations that they came up with is actually valuing the social care workforce and the caring workforce um, and making that a growth sector within the economy. Unfortunately, that wasn't carried forward, but I live in hope it's such a good idea that maybe it'll be taken on in this parliament. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. And um, I'm sorry about the opening uh, remarks on there, but thank you so much for giving your views on those questions. I'll just remind Lorna and the audience um, what these three questions were to be addressed. So the first one is partners on this event work on women's labour market inequality with a focus on a range of different groups, including young women, women in STEM and BME women. What will you do in your first parliamentary year to improve women's labour market equality and close the gender pay gap? And what would each party prioritise to ensure that public spending works to build greater equality between women and men? And finally, what more will you do to support unpaid carers? I'd like to pass on to, to Lorna. Brilliant, thank you very much. So I am myself a woman in STEM and for people who don't know, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Medicine and Maths. And these are professions that we know women are underrepresented in, which is such a shame because they are well-paid professions, permanent, reliable work, unlike so much work these days, which is precarious work. And also they're professions that can really make a difference. The, I mean, I'm working on the world's largest tidal turbine at the moment. So the next generation of renewable energy. Uh, I mean, I could do a whole hustings on the barriers that we face for women getting in, women into engineering and technology. We know that fewer girls study physics and maths. We know that those who do are actively discouraged from taking up engineering and directed toward biology and uh, you know what are considered the softer sciences, which is a load of rubbish. We, we need to we need to stop this kind of bias that happens right from the beginning in how we picture what women do. But that's more my personal axe to grind than than what's in our manifesto. Um, so our economy and everyday life is built on the invisible and unpaid labor of women and girls. Before the crisis, women did nearly three times as much of this kind of work as men. Social distancing measures, school closures, and an overburdened health system have increased the burden on women to cater and care for the needs of family. So all this in inequality poses a threat to women's health and well-being and acts as a barrier to gender equality in education and work. So as we move towards a more equal distribution of unpaid labor, women have to be supported to manage this to manage this burden for. So at university, we would suspend interest payments on student loans during maternity and paternity leave to tackle the additional costs which overwhelmingly fall on women. I was delighted to hear uh, Nicola Sturgeon bring this up as well. I believe, I'm willing to be challenged on this, that it was a Scottish Green that brought this up in Parliament because one of our members noticed it and went, how am I still paying interest when I'm on maternity leave? This isn't fair. Um, so that would be a really practical one we can get in right away. Um, at work, the pandemic has forced some employers to recognize not only that flexible and remote working is possible, but also how that affects gender inequality um, in people's homes lives. And also, to be fair, how that affects disabled people. One of the things I've seen over and over again during the pandemic is people saying, you know, disabled people have been asking for these sort of flexible remote arrangements for decades. And it was always like, oh, it can't be done, can't be done oh wait, no wait, hang on, now it can be done. So let's keep them in place to allow that increased accessibility of work to work for everyone. Um, in care, we want to ensure unpaid carers have access to the kind of training, the right equipment and the respite breaks that they need and to introduce health checks and access to flexible healthcare appointments for unpaid carers. In terms of investment, a big part of our manifesto is investment in transportation, in public transportation. So we need a gendered hierarchy of needs for transport that um, doesn't discriminate against women, particularly in rural areas. And 
the way we have things now hugely restricts the ability of women without cars to move work and social and educational opportunities. We need to flip that on its head. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lorna. I'll now move on to the next set of three questions that we have for you all. We've had many, many questions referencing the fact that two in three girls report being sexually harassed in the UK and asking what our education system needs to do to tackle violence against women, including an audience member who said, as a young woman who, while surviving the aftermath of sexual violence, attended school where conversations about sexual violence were taboo, it made me feel ashamed to hide what happened for years. She asks, do you recognise this problem within schools and have an idea how to help many young people who share the same experiences as me? The conviction rate for rape and attempted rape in Scotland is lower than for any other crime type. Will you commit to the judge-only rape trial pilot recommended in Lady Dorian's review into the management of sexual offences? And lastly, do you agree that the police acted appropriately in relation to the women protesting the death of Sarah Everard? I'd firstly like to pass... If we could pass on to uh, Nicola Sturgeon. Thank you. Um, so in answer to the first question, yes, I absolutely recognise uh, that perception and reality of the education system, but also not just in the education system, but I think right throughout our lives, women do not feel comfortable or often able to speak about experiences of uh, sexual harassment or uh, sexual abuse and assault. And we've got to change that. And we've got to change that by not putting the focus on women to change uh, our behaviour or present this as a problem that involves fixing women or women adapting and, and changing their behaviour in some way. We've got to start this very much in the education system in terms of educating boys uh, and men about how they should and should not behave towards women, about respect for women and start from that perspective. But we also have to promote um, a culture and an environment where women are able to speak up, out, up about what is acceptable and what is not, and for there genuinely not just in our rhetoric to be a zero tolerance um, against the, the, the behaviours that, that we are talking about here. And I think there is a, a massive job to be done here, and I think we have to start by recognising um, that we haven't made as much progress in this as perhaps we have told ourselves in recent years that, that we have done. One of the most striking things, um, apart from the obvious uh, tragedy of what happened to Sarah Everard, was in, for me as a 50-year-old woman, woman listening to a lot of what younger women were saying about that, about their experiences of not being safe on the street and the, the things that they were finding that they had to do to try to reduce the risk towards them, is that that is exactly the same as what my generation had to do, you know, when I was at university in my late teens, early 20s, and, and things have not changed sufficiently. And we've got to put much, much more of the onus on men uh, to sort this than we have always done in the past, which has put so much of the onus on, on women. But the, the, the centrality of the education system uh, to this can't be uh, overstated. Uh, secondly, in terms of, uh, the conviction rate for rape and sexual assault um, it is shockingly low. Um, and that says that the justice system is not working sufficiently uh, to protect women or to uh, make sure that women who experience rape or sexual assault get the justice that they deserve. I think Lady Dorian's review absolutely uh, should be seriously considered and taken forward in terms of some of its key commitments and I think that will be one of the, the key uh, challenges and, and key tasks for the next parliament but I also think um, and this is something I've changed my mind on is that it is time to consider the not proven verdict and our rules in Scots law on corroboration and lastly I always think it is a bit invidious for politicians to second guess the 
the conduct of the police in particular situations. But, you know, I am far from the only woman who felt deeply uncomfortable uh, watching what unfolded that Saturday night uh, when women were trying to come together uh, to make their voices heard right. over what had happened to Sarah Everett. Reflect on that. Thank you, Nicola. Could I now pass on to Willie Reddy to answer and address the questions? Thank you. So, Nicholas, absolutely right about this is the responsibility uh, of boys, of men. Uh, we have got uh, a burden which we need to understand and respect. And it's and it's sometimes it's the soft discussions. It's when you're I mean, they call it the locker room stuff, but it's actually when you're in groups of boys and you can see it, you all egg each other on. And it's actually a brave person who stands up to that. But we need to empower boys and men to do exactly that, because that's the way that we're going to change this culture. Um, and uh, unless we do that at the ground level, then it's not going to change. It's going to continue to be the same problem. We also need to empower schools, teachers, support staff, to be able to support and create an environment that where uh, women and girls can speak out and they don't feel as if they're causing the problem. Um, I heard a student today talking about that exact problem, about how she never spoke out about this for years because she felt she'd be making a fuss and she would be seen as the problem. And that needs to change because that's a poor reflection um, on our society. Um, I've, I, um, I've been doing some work with Miss M who was a former student at St Andrews, who was um, went through quite a famous civil case because um, the criminal case was not successful uh, as far as she was concerned. And she wants to um, remove the not proven verdict. And she makes quite a compelling case. Um, and I think we need to consider this seriously as well as the, the, um, the judge-led um, trials um, for rape. I think the pilot on that is something that that should be looked at. Of course, we're always anxious about when we change fundamental, the fundamental basis of criminal law and how we conduct these affairs. But I think a pilot is certainly worth a consideration, a serious consideration. So those are the things I think we should change. But at the heart of all this, we need to change the culture and boys and men are, have got to take the lead on that. Thank you, Willie. Could I now pass on to Jackie Bailey, please, to address these questions? Thank you. Thank you. Um, it, it is incredibly depressing, never mind disappointing, that, that women don't feel safe, that women are still subject to sexual harassment, whether it's, you know, you're walking down the street at your workplace. Um, it, it just it is appalling. Uh, it does need to be challenged from a very early age, challenged at school, challenged throughout life. Um, and it is very much about educating boys and men and enabling women to speak up. I remember when Zero Tolerance did a lot of incredibly progressive work within schools. They surveyed attitudes, they challenged those attitudes. Um, I hope that work is still continuing. If it's not, we should build it into the curriculum and we should ensure that people like Zero Tolerance are there in our schools. But it is about changing public attitudes. It is about you know, young men understanding that wolf whistling when somebody walks down the street is not acceptable. And you do that by changing public attitudes with whether it's a television campaign, a radio campaign. Um, we've done these public campaigns to challenge domestic abuse. We need to be doing it all the time to challenge this kind of behaviour. Um, secondly, on the, the question of the conviction rate, um, we would implement Lady Dorian's um, recommendations following her review. We think there is a real need for specialist sexual offence courts. Um, and it was uh, my Labour colleagues in, in members' bills that have brought forward the abolition of the not proven verdict. Um, I'm glad to hear that, that uh, others on the, on the Zoom call tonight um, are maybe changing their minds about that. We'll bring it back again because we think it hinders um, convictions in, in sexual offences. And finally, I mean, I think we were all quite appalled at the image we saw of that young woman being handcuffed and taken away by the, the police. The thing that, that astonishes me is that there was no real dialogue with the organizers uh, of that march, that demonstration, who actually wanted to assemble peacefully. And what we saw was, I thought, very heavy handed policing that didn't fit um, with, with what was required. 
given um, that they were demonstrating against uh, the problems that happened with Sarah Everard. Thank you, Jackie. Um, could I now pass on to Lorna Slater, please? Uh, th thank you very much for this question. I'll, I, I have a lot to say on the subject, so I'll try and hit a few things. Uh, I absolutely do not think that how that vigil was policed was appropriate. The police exist to protect property and the people who have interest in property. They don't exist to keep people safe. It drives me crazy when middle class and wealthy cis white men tell me that the police are here to protect us. Women know that the police don't protect us. People of color know this, trans people know this, working class people know this, sex workers know this. I wonder what it would look like if we did have a public body whose job it was to keep people safe. What would such a body prioritize? Not statues and piles of bricks, I expect. Anyway, <laughs> again, that's my, that's my personal take. Um, so in terms of official policy, the Scottish Greens will develop a strategy that effectively pre prevents and responds to all forms of violence towards women, including misogyny, street harassment, and online abuse. And that centers on the needs and concerns of survivors. At its heart will be a focus on education through ensuring the delivery of high quality consent-based relationship and sex education training and information campaigns and on ensuring public services better respond to the survivors of abuse. One of the things that has upset me so much about what we've seen in social media is how we know, we know as women that going to report a crime or even a harassment in your office at work is, is so much more traumatic almost than the harassment itself that you don't know where to start. You're, you're trapped uh, and we need to do more to help that. And it's about believing women, have a culture of listening to women instead of downplaying women's concerns as though somehow a man being falsely accused of harassment is worse than a person who's been harassed. Uh, that's another thing that drives me crazy. The Scottish Greens would establish an ambitious and secure funding future for specialist domestic and sexual violence services, increasing funding for victims groups, specifically Scottish Women's Aid and Rape Crisis Scotland, along with other groups providing women and girls support and advice services. We would ensure funding is available to, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, Tara, the Trafficking Awareness Raising Alliance who provide assistance to the increasing numbers of trafficked persons. And I would take a part, I would add, add another personal note to this, which is that I think on the on consent training, as important as that is, I think we can go further. Consent is a very low bar. I think we should be teaching in relationships education about a women's equal right to sexual pleasure and not like we can take that further than consent. Thank you, Lorna. And could we now hear from Rachel Hamilton, please? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I, I do believe there's, uh, you know, a lot of um, a lot that we can agree on here um, in what everybody said, and that, uh, of course, women have the right to feel safe in public places. And it's astounding that there's a UN survey that actually states that around about 97 percent of women um, have said that they young women that is in the UK have been um, sexually harassed. I mean, it's absolutely astounding and that we absolutely need to do something about it. And on the back of the, um, you know, the, the tragic uh, murder of Sarah Everard, um, the UK government did um, commit to updating their violence against women strategy and they have consulted UK wide on that. And the cons I think the consultation is, is closed now. But it'd be very interesting to, um, you know, review the findings of that and how they will take um, the recommendations forward. I did notice, um, interestingly, that there's a new campaign called Everyone's Invited, and it's very much about um, uh, rape culture and uh, particularly focusing on schools. And um, there's an argument going on at the moment about whether you should protect your daughter or educate your son. And I firmly believe that um, the two coexist. And um, just before um, Parliament rose um, for the elections and the campaigning, um, I submitted a, mo a motion. Um, and it really is very much about educating um, young people. Now, there was a social attitudes study done, um, which actually um, kind of doesn't, it, it, it doesn't say that the wrongness of people's behaviour is um, is actually having an effect on changing culture, and I just I do think that we need to 
ensure that young people um, uh, understand and are educated and they know what, what it means about um, uh, sexual violence and educating and empowering young people with that knowledge and so that they can navigate the consent that we're all talking about and, and have healthy relationships. And I would like my party, we haven't launched our manifesto yet, but I would like my, my party to um, launch a national campaign to challenge and change those attitudes. Now, um, just briefly on the police demonstrations, um, I, I don't really believe that it, they, they, they did a great job that day. Um, I think they could have been a lot more sensitive um, to what was actually happening in the cause. And we understand that there were COVID restrictions at the time, but um, perhaps it just could have been a, just a bit more recognition of the sensitivity um, of, of the issue. Now, um, moving on to Lady Dorian's recommendations, um, uh, like Jackie Bailey, uh, we the Scottish Conservatives believe that we very much want to uh, you know, recognise those and take those forward. And there's quite a lot in it. Um, I'm really pleased to hear that um, Nicola Sturgeon is considering, um, you know, ending the not proven verdict because we have pledged already, the Scottish Conservatives have already pledged new legislation on that, which would end that non, um, not proven verdict. Um, sorry, did you say something? Yeah, if you could wrap up now. Okay. Yes, I'll wrap up. Yes. Um, and I think finally uh, that, that there was a, a recommendation by Lady Dorian about the legal right to anonymity um, and that I think we are out of step with that and, and that would make a huge difference. So I'll, I'll close there. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. We'll now be having a short break for a few minutes and we'll be hoping to convene back again at 7.55 uh, for further questions. Thank you so much. So welcome back. I'll now begin with the next set of questions for our parliamentary speakers. What percentage of your candidates in this election are women? And what is your party doing to ensure mediocre women have the same chance as mediocre men on your regional lists? Now, you've talked about your priorities for women's equality in your opening statements. How will you ensure that these work for all women, including migrants, asylum seekers and refugees, not just those with the most privilege? And lastly, Scotland has human rights obligations to ensure that every woman and child experiencing domestic abuse can access specialist support when and where they want it. What will you do to better fund domestic abuse services and end the current postcode lottery of access to domestic abuse support? Now, these are very important questions and I'd like to um, start by asking Willie Rennie to uh, give his answers. Thank you. Could you give me the second one again, please? Yes, sure. You've talked about the priorities for women's equality in your opening statements. How will you ensure that these work for all women, including migrants, asylum seekers and refugees, not just those with the most privilege? Yeah, there is, there is a danger that those who are most vocal are the ones who are able to access uh, services. And it's the responsibility, I think, of government ministers, but also the leaders of the various agencies uh, to focus on making sure that the hardest to reach people are the ones that are considered first. Um, we can easily meet statistics by getting those who are the loudest uh, shouters, but we need to make sure that it's available for everyone. And in terms of domestic abuse, we need to make sure that the services are adequately funded um, right across the piece and um, the responsibility uh, both centrally and local government uh, to do that. So a greater scrutiny on those things uh, with a debate in Parliament to actually focus on where the gaps in the services uh, are. I think that's important too. And of course, Audit Scotland have also got the opportunity to look at these issues too, to make sure that there is a quality of provision. In terms of um, candidates, I've been I mentioned in my opening statement about how embarrassed we were in 2016, that it was all people who looked like me that were elected to Parliament for the Liberal Democrats, and I set about changing it. We had gender balance arrangements so that the top, the most winnable seats, um, are occupied by, by women. Um, so the various lists and the top constituencies um, have women at the top. Um, we have 
I couldn't tell the exact percentage of all the rest of the candidates, but I've been focused on making sure that the parliamentary representation next time round is much more balanced, much more diverse, and we've achieved that. Um, so I'm hoping with a successful election this year, we'll be able to prove it. But um, yeah, I've been determined to make this a change. It's been a, Jackie will know, uh, because there was a commitment where before the Scottish Parliament was set up to try and seek gender balance uh, amongst all the political parties. And we did not keep our side of the bargain. Uh, 20 odd years later, I managed to change that and I'm pleased I did because I think it'll be better for the Parliament having done so. Thank you, Willie. I'd now like to ask Jackie um, to give her responses. And if you need me to uh, go over any of the questions, any of any of you, please do let me know at any time and I can do that. Thank you. Um, I, I am very proud to be a member of the Scottish Labour Party that from the very first elections in 1999 has fielded and delivered 50-50 um, in, in seats in the Scottish Parliament. And I absolutely um, remember the debates we used to have about the mediocre men. In fact, you're probably being quite kind calling them mediocre. Um, and the very talented women that couldn't get near um, any winnable seats. So we set about deliberately putting a mechanism in place that meant that women were selected, not just in seats where we didn't have a chance, but actually in winnable seats by, by twinning seats together. Um, so, you know, we've kept that going, we've maintained that position so that now we are fielding candidates um, in all the list areas as well as in constituencies to ensure that there is an equal number of men and women, and uh, we've done it on the basis of, of winnability of seats as well. Um, so I hope we maintain that and I hope others in the Parliament follow that as well. In terms of women who are migrants, asylum seekers, refugees, um, we need to really work very hard to ensure all their voices are heard, but we need to do that as well by gathering data. Um, and we've talked about gender disaggregated data before, um, but there's actually a need for intersectional data so we understand and address the multiple layers of discrimination that exist. Um, and finally, of course, we can elect people to Parliament. And I'm very, very keen um, that we ensure across party that that happens. We have at least one candidate um, who is most definitely a migrant um, and she is in an electable position. So um, hopefully that will add to the diversity of voices in the parliament. Um, in terms of domestic abuse, let me just declare an interest. I used to many, many years ago volunteer for Women's Aid. Um, I was very proud to be the first um, minister who introduced direct funding from the Scottish Government um, to Women's Aid and we established the Domestic Abuse Development Fund. Um, we also did some groundbreaking work on public attitudes campaigns. I mentioned zero tolerance before, um, but we ran TV and radio campaigns um, that I think started to change attitudes. Um, I would put Women's Aid on sustainable funding because you know, it doesn't matter which local authority it is, you know, in my own area, we've had occasions where um, their funding has been threatened. Um, and so we do need to make sure that we value what they do and that they are funded appropriately in a sustainable way. Thank you, Jackie. Um, we'd now like to hear from Lorna. The Scottish Greens are different from other political parties because not only are all of our policies underpinned by our four core values, peace, sustainability, equality, and grassroots democracy, but we actually try to run our organization that way too. We experiment with democracy and inclusion, which is why, for example, we have co-leaders, unlike other parties. At least one of our co-leaders must always be a woman, which means that we keep a space open for a woman in a leadership role. And we actually do this for all leadership positions within the party. Every, com every committee, every rep group has this partnership situation. Um, and this keeps space for talented women. The, the comment about the mediocre women is, is sort of funny because we have the same thing in STEM. I remember an older woman engineer once telling me that we would know we had equality in engineering when we started getting mediocre women through. Uh, but I have to say with our candidate list, there are no mediocre women on it. They are all absolutely amazing. And I think it's right to say that it's not good enough to have balanced candidate lists. You have to have enough women 
in winnable positions. And of course, the Scottish Greens are in a bit of an unenviable position because our gender balance in our last parliamentary term, while we tripled our number of MSPs, our gender balance was very poor. So we've changed our tactics this time so that 80% of our winnable positions are being uh, t held by women. So we will get a whole slew of new Scottish Green women in and not a single one of them is mediocre. Uh, one of them, Nadia Kanyanji, uh, has a background as a refugee as well. So we will have that, if all, if all going well, we will have that firsthand experience, which will allow us to make really sensible decisions in this area. In terms of the uh, vic victims of domestic violence, the criminal justice system is failing to protect women and often causes further distress. We need to reform the criminal justice system so it works for survivors uh, with trauma-informed practice being part of its DNA. Too many women experiencing domestic abuse in Scotland lack access to justice because they are not eligible for civil legal aid. So we will work to ensure that all those who need legal aid and related support receive it. And we will work to enshrine the right for lifelong anonymity for victims of sexual crimes in law. In terms of diversity, we also stand for trans inclusive feminism. We believe that feminism includes protecting the rights of the trans community to self identify in a way that works for them. And we will work to deliver long overdue reforms to the Gender Recognition Act, including statutory self-declaration, recognizing of non-binary identities and all genders, and providing access to health care for trans minors with parental or guardian consent. Thank you, Lorna. I'd now like to pass on to Rachel to answer and address the questions. And if you'd like me to go through any of them, please do let me know. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, three important points and I think some, uh, uh, um, you know, ensuring that we have a diversity of candidates is something that we all aspire to. Um, I am very pleased to um, hear Lorna's uh, commitments there about female MSPs in the Green Party and Willie Rennie's because of course they've only got one right now. Um, we didn't do so well either in the Scottish Conservatives, we've only got 19% and uh, in total in the Scottish Parliament it's around about 35% and that was the same as in 2011. So this question is you know, very poignant um, and something that we all need to address. I think the SNP have done um, the best on this but of course they are the largest party as well. Um, in terms of what we're doing, um, I think it's a challenge um, to ensure that you know all sectors and sections and types and um, of people are represented in Parliament. We have gone a long way um, since certainly I was elected. Strangely, I was elected on an all women uh, seat and in 2017 in a by election um, for my constituency. Um, but I think that you know that is that's quite rare and that's unless that's the policy of your party. But um, yeah, we, we have got a Conservative BAME group. Um, we have BAME candidates this time. We have um, got uh, two organisations that support women. We've got um, Conservative Women's Organisation and we've got Women to Win. I'm part of both of those. And we what we do is we have a nurturing, supporting, mentoring, training um, and kind of general networking organization and it's been really really supportive and inclusive and it's brought loads and loads of um women forward i have to say um you know the, the question there about um attracting migrants asylum seekers and refugees um into the parliament i i have to say we haven't managed to do that and i and, you know i'll hold my hands up on that one um but of course these are all things we aspire to. Um, when I started in politics, I didn't really have any any support. I didn't have a women's network, and so I think we've made great strides on that one. Um, with regards to um, uh, domestic abuse, um, I work with my local Borders Women's Aid. Uh, there were two things that were really important as we went through the progress of the um, domestic abuse protection bill in the Scottish Parliament. Um, the first one was that I was really keen to ensure that um, women who'd left a re relationship were protected from um, financial ab abuse and coercive behaviour. Um, and I was reassured uh, that uh, we'd work through them and their feedback that they, they would be. And the second point, which is incredibly important, which I would like to see, is that during COVID, a lot of women um, who were seeking um, 
a safe space or support or refuge um, couldn't because there wasn't enough accommodation because uh, of course uh, it, you know restrictions didn't allow for women to share and so I think um, you can that, please. Thank you. I'll, yeah I'll just conclude on this because it's important but to ensure that uh, that this funding is put on a sustainable footing is incredibly important and to ensure that 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 single sex or single accommodation can be provided Thank you, Rachel. I'd now like to pass on to First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, please. Thank you. Um, so 47% of our candidates overall at this election are women. Um, our constituency candidates are gender balanced. Our regional candidates are slightly less so given that overall percentage. Uh, the reason our uh, list candidates perhaps slightly less so is because we prioritise at getting BAME candidates and candidates with a disability to the top of our list. So each of our lists is topped by either uh, somebody from our BAME communities or someone from a, a disability. The, the question about mediocrity is one that has, you know, dog women for my entire lifetime um, at all levels and probably long before that. The, one of my favourite sayings, because it is so depressingly true, is that women have to do twice as well to be considered half as good. Um, as men, and that is true that's true of somebody in my position, uh, just as it is true uh, for women at all walks of life. Um, and what we often find, of course, is that women self-select themselves uh, out of coming forward for things because we don't think we're good enough, whereas guys come forward when they are obviously not good enough, but they don't see that. Um, I don't accept, though, this idea of equalizing mediocrity. I actually think the opposite is the case. By definition, when you don't have gender equality in any organization, you don't have all your best people. So as we make space for more good women to come forward, hopefully what happens is we crowd out the mediocre men. And so we raise the bar of quality overall. It's a, a virtuous uh, cycle and a virtuous circle. So that's how it should work and hopefully how it will work. Um, in terms of the second question, uh, how do we ensure gender equality includes migrants, asylum seekers, people with disabilities? Uh, just firstly, relating back to the first question, top of our regional list in Glasgow is a former asylum seeker, the absolutely fantastic Rosa Sally, one of the, the Glasgow girls, which is something I'm really proud of. And, uh, you know, I think it is a, a really good symbol of the kind of, of country Scotland is, that that can happen. Somebody can be in an electable position uh, at this election. But intersectionality is vital. Um, I established a few years ago the First Minister's Advisory Council on Women and Girls, and the most, uh, some of the most recent work it's been doing is on intersectionality, and the recommendations it is making there are ones I'm keen to take forward in the next parliament. Um, and finally, on funding for uh, making sure that victims of domestic abuse or violence get access to specialist services. I mentioned this briefly in my opening remarks. Uh, waiting times for access to specialist support services are too long and there's too much geographic variation. Uh, as things stand, the Scottish Government uh, is planned to invest about £49 million over the next three years to support the Equally Safe strategy. Our manifesto will commit to doubling that to £100 million to focus more on prevention, but also to fund better and more sustainably frontline specialist organisations like Rape Crisis, Women's Aid, and to radically reduce the time that women are waiting for access to services. And you know, if I look across a manifesto uh, with many commitments, I think that is one of the most important. Thank you, Nicola. Now, we've received lots of questions on reproductive justice, including on free period products, workplace menopause policies and racism in maternal health care. What will you do to ensure reproductive and sexual rights for women, particularly disabled women in Scotland? And a quick yes or no question, will you work for the decriminalisation of abortion in Scotland? The second question is, given recent online and offline debates, can the parties clarify their stance on trans rights? and what they plan on doing to ensure the safety of trans women in Scottish society. And finally, Scotland is home to the only accredited museum dedicated to women's history in the whole of the UK. 
Glasgow Women's Library. What item would you donate to this recognised collection of national significance to symbolise your political life or achievements? I'd like to start off by asking Jackie to address these questions. Wow, um, I was struck by the last one, but I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, certainly, I, I am very proud that it was my colleague Monica Lennon that brought forward a member's bill on period poverty. I'm delighted that uh, she was supported by the Scottish Government um, and that indeed across the Parliament um, people voted for her. I think it's that kind of approach that makes a real difference um, to women's experience. We are also um, in our manifesto committing to setting up a women's health fund because we think there is a real need for research and improved services for women, um, particularly round about um, reproductive services and access to sexual health services. Um, we will protect abortion rights. Um, we certainly have studied the work of the STUC on menopause, and we think that should be um, something that, that gets taken into the workplace as well. Um, and we are very keen on improving screening, particularly for women, um, round about cancer screening, because we know that in disadvantaged areas, um, there is absolutely you know, very low take up rates and we need to find new and innovative ways of ensuring that things like, you know, cervical smear tests could perhaps be done at home um, if that would benefit from, if that would increase the uptake. So, so absolutely um, on that issue. Can you repeat the second question? Sorry. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, the second question is given recent online and offline debates, can the parties clarify their stance on trans rights and what they plan on doing to ensure the safety of trans women in Scottish society? Okay, sorry, I missed that completely. A very important issue. Um, I can say that from a Labour Party perspective, we would support the Gender Recognition Act. Um, I recall the debate we had round about section 28 in the very first parliament, um, and we delivered that change against much hostility, much opposition, um, but it was the right thing to do. Now, it generated a lot of heat. Um, equally, the Gender Recognition Act has generated similar heat. Um, I think the parties need to work together. Um, we need respectful debate, but we do and can take immediate action to demedicalize the process for trans people. Now, the extent to which there has been a level of online abuse that is just simply intolerable. We need to call it out. All of us have a responsibility to call it out and protect trans people from that. Equally, I think the hate crime bill that has recently been passed um, by the parliament um, will have a role in that too. Finally, what, what would I donate to the Glasgow Women's Library? Um, that's a really, really difficult one. I tend to, you know, it, it, it I don't know whether, and it's, it's typical, women tend to not push themselves forward or anything like that. I suspect what I would do is, um, is probably donate something that, that is about my daughter, simply because I think when you come into okay. politics, you do it for the right reasons, but you do it so that actually you are passing on to the next generation a better society than the one that you grew up in. So I suppose it would be something in relation to my daughter that I would donate. Oh, thank you, Jackie. And I'd like to hear from um, Lorna Slater now, please, thank you. Uh, right, I'll try and run through all these really quickly. So in terms of decriminalization of abortion, yes, absolutely, we'll do more than just protect uh, abortion rights. We'll improve that, we'll work to decriminalize it, removing the two doctor rule. Um, and retain the provision for early medical abortions to be at home, which was introduced during, introduced during the pandemic. That was a real game changer, I think. Uh, we will also support calls on the Scottish government to ask health boards to review their maternity model to ensure that it meets the needs of rural and remote communities. Um, I've already spoken about our position on trans rights and some of our policies there, including getting that GRA Act reform, uh, reformed. The Scottish Greens have been really clear on this. Trans women are women, trans men are men. Non-binary um, identities are, are, are normal. They are, you know, they should be part of our everyday discourse. Um, it's, we're not willing to debate human rights. All humans have human rights. 
I think that in terms of safety for trans people, I was horrified by some of the proposed amendments to the hate crime bill, and I'm glad that those were all defeated. I think the, the best thing we can do right now in terms of safety of trans people is get the GRA reforms done and stop giving airtime to the kind of people who equival equivocate trans people with uh, being sort of sex, sex criminals and, and so on. That's it's not okay to give people like that airtime. We need to stop that, stop that right away and, and move on to more important issues that affect the trans community, like getting adequate health care in a timely manner and an appropriate manner and preferably fully integrated the way it is in other countries where you can just go to your GP and get the help you need there. You don't have to wait literally years for some specialist clinic. Um, what in terms of what I would give to the Glasgow Women's Library, I was lucky enough two years ago to be selected uh, as one of um, 100 women in STEM from all around the world. I think there were 80 of us in the end who went to go to the Antarctic to study both leadership and climate change. The whole point of this expedition was to make connections between women in STEM all over the world and try to bridge the gap between what scientists know about climate change and what politicians were not doing about it. So the idea is that if all women work together, we can save the world, which is a pretty powerful thing. So I would donate to the Glasgow Women's Library a photograph of these women from all over the world in the Antarctic working together for this common goal. Thank you, Lorna. And now I'd like to hear from Rachel. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I mean, the the um, the pausing of the GRA uh, reform uh, last year has has kind of put um, the whole trans issue on hold, I suppose, in the Parliament. Um, it, it's a it's a subject that has raised um, very strong feelings um, and uh, from all sides. And so, you know, our party are very keen. Uh, to see the legislation brought forward and to bring the debate to the table uh, and to to discuss um, the GRA reform and to consider any changes um, that need to be um, implemented, particularly um, to ensure that people can live as they want to live and be who they want to be. And so I, I think that's one of the most important things um, that, that we can do for equality. Um, the point about, um, you know, making sure that uh, women's health equality is to the fore. Today, we announced um, a, a new policy uh, as part of one of the new ma manifesto commitments, which was to um, increase the um, funding to the NHS by 2 billion by the end of the parliament. So that would mean increasing 2% um, either above inflation or above um, the Barnard Barnet consequentials. So I think that's important when you look at it in the round of some of the issues that the other participants have discussed here today about women's um, health equalities, um, particularly um, you know, uh, looking at the right women's health advice uh, and, and ensuring that you know we have good um, information formed services for women. Um, I, I think Jackie um, also mentioned um, uh, enshrining sort of uh, the support for women who are going through a menopause in the workplace. I think that's something that uh, Christina McKelvey led a debate in the parliament, um, which I was involved in, and there was uh, cross-party support to kind of bring that forward. At the moment, of course, it's just a sort of a um, a code or a, a voluntary basis uh, for uh, companies to adopt. But I think it's really important that women are supported in the terms of the, uh, the health inequalities that they do experience. With regard to um, uh, abortion, I can't actually remember the question. I'm so sorry. Um, sorry, I think my, my uh, mic is muted. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, we received a lot of questions on reproductive justice, including on free period products, workplace menopause policies and racism in maternal health care. What will you do to ensure reproductive and sexual rights for women, particularly disabled women in Scotland? And will you work for the decriminalisation of abortion in Scotland? Was the, was the question. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I want to be quite practical about this because obviously we need to ensure that um, services are delivered locally. And I, it's important to um, make sure that the, the services that are close closest to the communities that understand the people within those communities are preserved. And I think that, you know, with COVID, it's been really difficult for people to access GP services and to actually have a conversation. And some people are far from um, able to uh, communicate by uh, a screen. And so it is important. One of the, the, the things I feel passionately about, particularly through my work with my own constituency, is um, restoring face-to-face -face services. In Ten regard seconds, please. Sorry? Ten seconds, please. Oh, yes. And um, the last thing uh, to do with the Glasgow Women's Library, I think it would have to be something to do with the environment and climate change. And I think it would be um, a kind of a some sort of uh, project uh, that was uh, with them and uh, the delivery of the um, uh, COP26. Thank you, Rachel. Like, we'd like to hear from Nicola now. Okay, um, I'll run through these as quickly as possible. On the clutch of questions related to women's health, um, I am very proud that we came together as a parliament uh, to secure universal access to free period products, uh, passing Monica Lennon's uh, bill. I think that's not just great for women's rights, but actually a good example of cross-party consensual working. Um, I am passionately supportive of protecting and enhancing uh, abortion rights um, and uh, making sure, as I think Lorna said, that the changes that were made during the pandemic become permanent. You know, this is one of the few health rights uh, that we don't see as being important to make as accessible and as convenient and as patient-centred as possible. So that is really important. I already indicated uh, our support for a women's health plan uh, to far improve uh, the understanding of, awareness of, and support for women, for example, going through the menopause, and uh, it's, uh, I'm getting to an age where that's becoming something of a personal interest as well as a, a generic uh, interest. Um, moving on to the second uh, questions about trans rights, I am a, a strong supporter of trans rights, and as a lifelong committed feminist, while I've got breath in my body, I will challenge this notion that trans rights and women's rights are intention and competition. They are not. Uh, the threat, as we've been discussing earlier on tonight, to women's safety is abusive men. It is not trans women. So what do we need to do? We need to work to detoxify this debate because it has become, I think, harmful to trans people and upsetting to many women. Uh, we've got to have zero tolerance of transphobia. It is perfectly uh, legitimate to raise concerns, but we shouldn't allow that to become a cover for transphobia. And we do need to make it easier and less traumatic and stigmatizing for trans people to get legal recognition. And I really hope that is something we can build consensus on in the next parliament. Um, and lastly, the Glasgow Women's Library. I love the Glasgow Women's Library, one of my favorite organizations in the whole country. I'm tempted to say I would donate some of my ever increasing uh, book collection because it is uh, rapidly taking over my entire house. But I've got a serious suggestion, which if the Women's Library want to take me up on afterwards, I'm happy to, to talk to them. Every time somebody gets sworn in as First Minister, uh, you get a seal of office. And I now have two of these. It remains to be seen, of course, whether I will get a third. Uh, but given that I am the first woman to hold uh, the office of First Minister, uh, if the Glasgow Women's Library wanted me to donate at some point my first seal of office, uh, that's something that I would be very honoured to consider doing. Well, thank you, Nicola. I'd like to pass on to Willie Rennie now to address these questions. Can I just say, I thought that was a particularly strong and, and powerful um, and unequivocal statement from, from Nicola about the GRA and one that I would wholeheartedly um, support. I think the rights of trans people are the same as the rights for everyone else. Um, I, I regret the, the nature of the debate, and I think we do need to take it into the parliamentary sphere and conduct it in a respectful way so that we can address any of the concerns and anxieties. But we need to follow international best practice on this. And there is good practice in other parts of the world where it's working successfully. 
um, it's the current arrangements are causing so much anxiety and stress amongst trans people. And we do need to, to change the arrangements and change them soon so people don't have to go through the trauma that they're currently experiencing. So I hope we can reach a cross-party consensus on this, not just on the substance, but also in the way that we conduct the debate. And I think that's important for us all to do, because then that will reflect in the rest of society um, the way that this debate um, is conducted. I'm in favour of decriminalisation um, of abortion. I think that's an important step as well. We've made, uh, I think, some clear statements from our party conference on that, and one that I wholeheartedly support. Um, as well, Monica Lennon did a great job on period poverty. I think, again, we need to make sure that there is a, a regular debate and discussion about the adequacy of um, services for women right across this sphere, because, again, um, they are too often uh, left behind and the postcode lottery is inadequate. Um, and then finally say, I think there's probably a bit too many men's artefacts in all museums across the world. So I'm not going to offer anything from myself. Um, but my, my mother, who's I think now 86, is a keen poet. Uh, and I think I might donate some of my mother's poems to the museum. Thank you, really. Now, um, I'll now ask you all each in turn if you'd like to give us any closing statements or revisit any of the questions that you feel you may want to further expand on. Um, we've just heard from Willie, but we're going to turn to you again, Willie, to answer that question. Okay. Um, thank you very much. And thanks for your, I think, the longest questions that I've ever experienced in my life. It's an exercise in itself to remember uh, all the questions, but you've done it brilliantly. So thank you very much for, for chairing this evening and all the panellists and the audience for your brilliant question. It's probably been an education for me this evening. I've been listening carefully, trying to learn a lot um, from the questions and from uh, the answers. Um, we do like to keep it hidden in Parliament, but we do quite agree with each other quite a lot. Um, and I think tonight has been an example of that. There's been some excellent cooperation, particularly over the last year in Parliament. Um, and it often is uh, women who are leading on that cooperation. We've already referred to Monica Lennon, uh, ministers like Kate Forbes, uh, Fiona Hislop, Jean Freeman on the government side have been excellent at reaching out and collaborating. Liz Smith from the Conservatives and Alison Johnson uh, from the Greens, in addition to all those who are on the panel this evening. But I think the main takeaways for me is about changing the behaviour of men and boys, about more women in leading roles and in leading jobs across the country, services in the justice system that supports women, enhancing mental health, expanding early learning and childcare, but also boosting uh, social care pay. So thank you very much for this evening. I thoroughly uh, enjoyed it um, and I hope I'm invited back again in the future. Thank you. Thank you, really. We'd now like to hear from Jackie if we've got any closing remarks. Thank you very much. Um, I think what, what tonight tells me and, and I hope happens is that um, there is cooperation across the Parliament because when we do cooperate we can achieve much um, and I would hope that, that we continue to have the direct input and expertise from organisations represented here tonight and indeed women from all walks of life um, to help us shape that, that approach, um, the better politics, better policies and um, certainly in the last parliament, we saw legislation from the government on domestic abuse, on gender balance, on public bodies. Um, we saw the members bill from Monica Lennon that's already been mentioned on period poverty. And that does give me hope for the future and for the next parliament. Um, I always remind myself, though, it's not enough just simply to have women in the parliament. Visibility is really important, but actually what matters more is what you do when you're there and what you do together in number. Um, and yes, we need male allies too. So I welcome um, the commitment from Willie Rennie, um, who, who is with us tonight. But, but I come back to what I think we need, which is you know, action on baselines, things like better gender disaggregated data, extending gender budgeting, um, reviewing the public sector equality duty because it hasn't worked, action on equal pay and low pay, women's health, violence against women, um, occupational segregation. Um, and let's do something, you know, not that radical. Let's make every public body, as we did with the Scottish National Investment Bank, 
and I pay tribute to Engender and Close the Gap um, for their work on that. Let's make them have equality strategies. Let's make them in what they do actually bear in mind the need to fund different things based on an equality perspective, not just as an organization, but in what they do. And finally, um, if we can all leave you know, a better place for our daughters and indeed our sons, then I think we will have done a reasonable job. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. I'd now like to hear from Lorna, any closing remarks? Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for coming along today. It's great to see a Hustings where there's a, a positive vibe, a collaborative vibe. And I think that this is actually evidence of what you get when you get women working together. And I'd like to have a thought about what if women and men led our world in equal measure? Would our world and the decisions we make on behalf of future generations be different? Would we be more collaborative, more inclusive, more legacy minded and more trustworthy with assets, people and money? I'd like to see the type of politics that is better suited to the world we are now living in with a great, greater focus on what we all share. I want to see politics with integrity, a drive for results, an ability to motivate others, and a deep care for the relationships and the will to collaborate toward our shared ambition. Our cause is urgent. We have 10 short years to make major changes to our society, politics, and way of life, or climate breakdown will have gone past the point that it can be managed. We know the science. We need to work together to build effective policies and see them implemented. I really believe that women working together can save the world. I'm so proud of our women lead candidates, the people who are gonna be your green MSPs in the next parliament. They include disabled women, women of color, women with kids, women without kids, young women, women with experience of the third sector, women in STEM, with experience in politics and environmentalism, in working with refugees and working with the homeless. In this election, the Scottish Greens would ask you to vote like our future depends on it. Thank you, Lorna. I'd like to now pass on to First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, please, to give your closing remarks. Well, first of all, uh, massive thanks to Engender and all the partner organisations for organising uh, what's been a really uplifting um, session this evening. And thanks to everybody who has joined online. I suppose my my closing reflections really are that we need to make the next session of Parliament on all of the issues that we've been talking about here tonight genuinely transformational. You know, if I think back over my entire time in politics, which is a fair few years now, um, we have made progress, there's no doubt about that, but it's been quite incremental progress. Sometimes you go through periods and on some aspects of this where it feels as if we're making great strides forward, but at other times it feels as if we take one step forward and two steps back and it's all very slow and it's all very incremental. We need to really pick up the pace and fundamentally change things for the better. We are not a minority in our society um, and we've got to you know, see the pace of change reflect uh, that very much. And again, when I think over my own life and career, what is also really striking, and I, I referred to this earlier on in some of the debate about uh, women's safety, is how many of the issues we are talking about now, if I was to turn the clock back 30 years to when I was a much, much younger woman in politics, actually, it would all be the same issues that we were talking about. And that is also a signal of the fact that progress has been made, yes, but perhaps not enough. So we really need to push on and make the fundamental change that is required. And my last point is this, and again, it's been alluded to, so often the debate about gender equality focuses on what we need to do to fix women, to you know, make women more likely to come forward, to make women more appointable to boards or more electable, um, or how do women change their behavior to make them safer? We've got to stop that being the focus of the debate about gender equality. What we need to do is change the systems that have embedded gender inequality for so long. And yes, on some things, we need to change men and we need to change uh, men's attitudes to things. So those are my closing remarks, but this session tonight has filled me with a lot of optimism and, and energy. So thank you again to everybody. Thank you, Nicola. And I'd now like to pass on to Rachel Hamilton uh, to hear her 
closing remarks, please. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for organising. Thank you to Engender. Thank you to everyone who's taken the time to join us online. And thank you for so beautifully chairing tonight. Uh, as Willie said, I don't think we've ever been as challenged. Maybe the First Minister has, but um, maybe not me and Willie. Uh, but uh, no, it, it really was an enjoyable event. And I think it's um, important to note that um, you did ask if there was anything I wanted to add that I missed. And, I, and, and my party also uh, supported Monica Lennon's period poverty bill, um, which I think was, you know, so it, it set um, a precedent. It was a, a fantastic example of what the Scottish uh, Parliament can do when they come together in a cross party manner like that. And I suppose without listing the um, Scottish Conservative manifesto um, policies, um, and boring you with that, I just want to reflect on the fact that so many fantastic women are leaving Parliament. And I think it's a shame because our place is, you know, meant to set a bar and it's meant to be an example. And it hasn't been an example. It's been a poor show in the last five years, I would say, in terms of the family friendliness of the Parliament. Um, the way that it, it shines a light on the fact that women feel as though they can't do their job effectively and run a family. I think we need to improve our diversity and it shows tonight that all of us are committed to doing that. Um, on more, uh, you know, serious issues, we do need to improve the health outcomes for women. And whilst we've done wonderful things to narrow the gender pay gap, we also need to narrow the disability employment gap um, and do much more in terms of putting women at the heart of rebuilding um, following a pandemic in terms of our green recovery um, and ensuring that women um, feel able to, to be part of a successful and prosperous Scotland. But thank you very much for tonight. Thank you, Rachel. And I'd just like to thank all of our speakers for attending today's hustings and in gender, as well as the women's equality organisations that are participating tonight. I would hope that this has given the public and organisations the platform to ask their questions directly to our party political candidates. And tonight we've addressed some very important issues on women's equality that can only further help us to get a clear idea on each party's commitment to these issues. I would encourage you all to read the individual manifestos from each party and ensure you do go out to vote on the 6th of May. And with that, I'd like to conclude today's hustings by wishing you all a pleasant evening and I'll hand over to Director of Engender, Emma Rich. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tasneem. Um, you've been a fantastic chair this evening. I'd like to thank you and um, all of the women's organizations who partnered to hold tonight's event. And of course, uh, to those candidates who've given freely of their time this evening uh, to be challenged on what they're planning to do for women's equality and rights in the next parliament. Of course, all women's organizations who've hosted this evening uh, have been talking to parties for some time about their manifestos. Um, we will be um, sharing our manifesto and gender publicly tomorrow, uh, and we'll also uh, circulate information about where you can find the manifestos of other partner organizations. So you can do your own uh, review of how those match up with what the parties are promising. And um, we're also going to be in touch with Engender's gender edit of the political party's manifestos when they're out. So you can read a digest of all of the commitments relevant to women's equality and rights. And we'll let you have information about how you can find out how your candidates are. Thank you so much for coming this evening to hold parties to account uh, for how they're going to progress women's equality and rights uh, and create the transformational parliament uh, that candidates talked about this evening. Uh, you're already home, so I can't wish you safe home, but I hope you have a lovely evening and really hope to see all of you soon at another Engender event. Thank you.